Hi everyone and welcome to this amazing live lesson from Ocean and Climate Live and we are celebrating British Science Week 2024 and it's my delight uh, to welcome Ben and Tara to talk about how we have time or what time we have to heal the sea. We've had so many um, shout outs to do. We'll just do a few shout outs before we get into the lesson proper. So we've got year four at Norton Park. Hi, everybody there. Year six at Bill um, Key Primary School in Gateshead. Hi, um, P65 in, in Kilm Arkham, um, not far from Aaron. St. Ursula's Catholic Primary School, St. Thomas's Clark. Hi, everyone there. Year um, three at Wollenwick Junior School in Stevenage. We've got year five Badger class at Ashton St. Peter's and Dunstable. Um, Belton Lane Primary in Grantham. Fantastic to have you with us. Dragons class in Holton. Queen's Manor Primary School. Um, 4NH and 4NM at Emma Green Primary School. Fantastic to have you. Amaya's on, which is great. And then we've got Penthorpe School in Rudgwick. Um, in, and that's Horsham. So fantastic to have you all and all the other classes who are joining. So in this live lesson, what we're going to do is we go, are going to look at the amazing work uh, that Ben and Tara have been doing up in Aram this very, very shortly. We're going to look at some seabed superheroes um, and how they are helping our wonderful seas and oceans. And then we're going to look at all the other things we can all do to help the sea. But before we start, Ben and Tara, fantastic to have you with us. Can I just ask, this is all part of a really huge science program called the Convex Seascape Survey. What's that all about? Yeah, hi everyone, and thanks, thanks Jamie. Yeah, so we're two marine scientists working on the Convex Seascape Survey. Um, and we're basically part of a much larger group of scientists from all over the world who are going out into the ocean and investigating the seabed. Um, this is a really, really large area, um, but we don't really know much about it still. Um, and so we're using lots of different scientific equipment, lots of different um, experts looking at the seabed and just learning more about it, learning about the animals that live there and, and how it all works. Amazing. And um, just um, so thinking through... Um, I'm just trying, trying, trying to, to 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 remember. Sorry, we're just going to have a little bit of a time out. Eddie, who's behind the scenes, is just working. I know some of you can't see the videos and comments coming through, um, and just checking the settings there to make sure um, that everybody um, can see it. So fingers crossed. Do let us know on the chat um, if that's coming through. But fantastic. Um, so what I would love to know is that you've been up in Scotland. Um, on some field work. Um, whereabouts um, in Scotland was that? Um, so we went to an island called the Isle of Arran. Um, so it's up in the west, so the west side of Scotland, um, in a really beautiful place called uh, the Firth of Clyde. So it's a really beautiful stretch of water. Um, yeah, and it's got some really amazing marine life under the sea and on the seabed there. Um, so we just went to really have a look at what, yeah, what, what lives down there. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Be beautiful area. Lots of amazing things to see there. Um, and you, you, you are doing marine, marine science. So you're a marine scientist. I think we've got these amazing pictures of you. So it looks like a pretty perfect job out on a boat. Um, lots of different bits of kit, putting them into the water, looking at different animals. What What's the sort of day like um, being a marine scientist? Yeah, so it, it really varies. Um, you know, some days are amazing. A, a lot of the time, that's right, we do go out on the boat and uh, we have perfect weather. <laughs> we see dolphins, we see whales, we get a nice suntan and everything goes perfectly well and we collect all the data that we want to collect. And then other days, it's the exact opposite. We go out on the boat, it's swelly, it's windy, we're getting hailed on, um, the equipment breaks. Um, but, you know, those days are kind of just as exciting and, and just as interesting because it, it gives us these challenges, these problems that we have to overcome and um yeah it's, it's generally just an awesome job we love it and um we're really really grateful to be part of this project and, and to bring marine scientists generally it's it's wicked amazing and and we you go out on the sea and i can see sort of things pictures of mud you've had you know and, and all those kind, kind of things that you, you sort of on the boat do you ever get to see 
what's underwater do you scuba dive or how, how how do you get to see see what you're studying yeah so we do scuba dive um so it's really fun so yeah it, it basically means that we can breathe underwater um so we can go down and swim around with all the life that lives down there um sometimes we're looking at things that live really really deep so we can't actually physically get there ourselves um and then when that's the case we've got some equipment that can actually help us see what's down there when we're still on the boat so we can throw things like cameras or like um, underwater robots um, into the water and send them down to the seabed and they sort of swim around and have cameras on them and yeah show us what's living down there um, but yeah we both we both really enjoy diving uh, I think that's definitely a, a really a really fun bit of the job yeah. Um, yeah and it really depends where you are you know sometimes it's it's nice and shallow and, and it's very light and you can jump in and it's really warm and it's lovely and then other times it's very very dark and cold and that's uh, time for the robots to come out. Of <laughs> um, so, so up an hour, and I think we've got some some beautiful um, video which we can see of of the seabed, and it, it looked like a completely different world to me. I think the first one up is is, is from this is a still taken from it. Some some I've got to see some crabs, and then I can see lots of wavy arms. Sort of what 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 what's what's going on there. Um, so yeah, those those wavy arms belong to little creatures called brittle stars. So they're really similar to starfish, which you, you might know about. Um, and as the name suggests, brittle, so they're they're quite fragile little things. They've got these really delicate arms. Um, but yeah, they put them up into the air like that to feed. So they're taking bits of food from the water um, and putting them into their mouths. Um, yeah, and as you can see, there's loads of them there. So this is quite a, a healthy, yeah. <laughs> But a healthy bit of the seabed. Um, we've also, yeah, we've got a couple of crabs in there as well. I think that's that's Tara's favourite crab. Oh. We're down in Cornwall here, and it reminds me of Cornish pasties. These crabs. So some people call them edible crabs because they look a little bit like pasties. Or even pasty crabs. Look what I call them. They've got these crimps around the outside, like a like a pasty. But yeah, fantastic. It sounds wonderful. And and there's another. There's a very sort of pink view. I've 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 got. So it's easy, we can we can bring up. Um, and something look, that looks like a sort of sea anemone, sort of stuck, stuck, stuck in the middle. Uh, it, it, is what, what's that? Is that another sort of like sea star, or what? what what's going on in this in this clip? Yeah. So this this clip's really really cool. Um, so there's a few different things going on here. That that little thing in the middle that you mentioned that looks like an anemone is actually um, it's actually a cup coral. It's a type of coral. So it has um, the differences. It has a little skeleton around around the side. So it's kind of lives inside of that. And then all around, it looks kind of like sort of like seaweed, sort of bushy seaweed, red stuff, but that's actually um, a colonial animal as well. So that's, um, it's, it's called bryozoan. Um, it's kind of a very strange type of animal. And if you look really, really closely at each one of those bushy bits, you essentially see tiny little organisms on their own, so all joined together. So we call that colonial animal. Wow. Those corals are like some, some of the only cold water corals. That, that are around they're usually really warm water species so we're really lucky to have those so cool um i think we've got one last clip this is just a very very skittish looking fish yeah. skittish along the, the, the floor just does this introduce a fish into this whole whole thing what, what what's that one yeah so this is um this is a sole that we have here and so they live on the seabed pretty much most of the time you can see because it's really flat it's really well designed it's been evolved to crawl along the seabed it can also, it's quite a strange looking fish. It's got its eyes on one side of its body. And that means what it can do, it can bury itself in on one side, disguise itself. You can see the color is very, very similar to the seabed itself. So it's kind of camouflaged. And um, predators won't necessarily be able to see it very well, but also its prey won't be able to see it very well. It means it can keep its eyes out while half of its body is buried. Look out for things that it can either run away from or chase after. And um, yeah, he's just scuttling around there, having a bit of a time, running over some scallops as well. So um, yeah, really, really cool bit of fish is that. And we see those quite a lot in Aaron, which is which is really, really nice to see. So um, uh, very, very strange animal, but one of, one of my favourites. Brilliant. And we've we've got this um, beautiful, beautiful, um, you know, seabed and amazing creatures. Some I'd never heard of. Bryozoans is a new one for me. Um, but what we're talk talking in this first section about the impact of human activity. So, so what what have people done to the seabed around Britain? And I think we've got an animation. 
that shows um, one of the activities that can harm the seabed. So if, can, can you let us know before um, sort of what what this is, is showing or, or what, what's happening? Yeah, sure. So, um, so for a very long amount of time now, in, in the UK especially, we've been fishing the oceans um, around the UK, taking fish out and lots of different methods. But one of these is called bottom trawling. Okay. And that's what this animation here is describing. And essentially, this is where you get a, a boat which has a large net behind it that sinks to the sea floor, and it essentially drags along the bottom of the sea floor, catching all the fish that, that are living there. Um, the trouble with this method of fishing is that it, it also digs up a lot of the things, these animals that we've just been talking about, these brazilians and these um, sea stars and brittle stars and things like that, they all get swept up in this net along with the fish that we're trying to catch. And that can be quite damaging for the seabed. So, um, you know, it's, it's one comparison that people like to talk about. This is, is kind of going into a rainforest or a forest with a massive bulldozer trying to catch birds, but you end up sort of taking out all the trees, all the other animals that live there at the same time. So it can be quite a damaging practice. And we've been doing this for quite a long time now in the UK. And it's, um, it's yeah, it's caused quite a lot of problems to our seabed. And uh, you, we can look at a cartoon or an animation and it seems okay. And you can talk about sort of analogies like the, the rainforest that really brought it home with, with, with the bulldozer. But I think you've, you've got some footage for us um, that shows actually, you know, we, we, we've seen what the seabed can look like, but let's just have a, a, a sense of what, what, what the, those fishing techniques can do to a seabed. And, um, how, how, how does this sort of thing, sort of when you see it, how does it, how, how do you, how does it make, how make you feel? Yeah, it, well, it makes me feel really sad. I think, like, I really like the way that Ben described it, like a forest, because, you know, we've seen those pictures and it, it can be like a forest under there with lots of plants and animals. And when you look at it, when these um, these boats and nets have been through and there's just sort of nothing left. So I, I feel really sad. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to see. And, you know, obviously um, catching fish is an important part of our, of the way that we live and you know it's we need to eat and things like that but it's it's definitely a very destructive way of doing it and i think one of the although i use that um comparison with the rain with the forest or whatever with the bulldozer one of the big differences of the ocean is that this is an impact that we've not really been seeing mm. for hundreds of years so you know you could have a forest that's next door to your house and someone comes and cuts it down you'd be quite upset about it but it's only really quite recently that we've been sort of aware of how much impact that we've been having on the seabed because we just can't see it. Brilliant. I was going to, was going to do a, a quick poll now just to, to see it's coming up in, in the interaction box as a side of the video. So just, just um, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a, a pause, a, a minute or so, um, just just to sort of have a think in, in the class how, how this, um, how does this change in the seabed makes you feel? Um, and then and we'll come back and we'll talk about um, what can happen next?
amazing. And thank you so much all for voting in that poll. Um, a lot of sort of sad, as sort of angry and anxious um, coming through, which really echoes um, what Ben and Tara were talking about. So for this for this next section of this live lesson, we're going to be looking at some of those wonderful creatures who can help. Um, so our seabed superheroes. And we've got um, a great range of animals to talk, talk about. Hopefully you've got the student sheet um, up. And so that will show you the animals we're going to be talking about. And as Ben and Tara give you a little bit of description, then you'll be able to make some notes there on these very, very cool creatures. Um, ben and Tara, uh, we're going to start off with something that we uh, I thought only lived lived in my garden, a worm, but this one's a ragworm. After we've seen the sort of dredging coming through, what what is the um, what what happens then? What are the, I mean, is the worm the first animal that comes come comes in? Yeah, so so basically, what's happened after that dredge has come, or the trawls come through multiple times, um, a lot of these animals will have disappeared, um, and so you kind of got this this sediment that's empty. There's nothing really, really living there anymore. Um, but but you know, life is very resilient. Um, these animals are amazingly adaptable, and what we can have is certain organisms will return to this kind of um, this this substrate or this mud that's been turned over, they'll return first. And they're, they're what we call pioneer organisms. And they're very, very, um, sort of, they're, they're very fast breeders. Um, they're very resilient, they're very adaptable, and they'll come first. And that usually is the worms. So yeah, we have this, uh, the ragworm here, um, in, the, in that slide there, we can see it's, uh, it's not actually my favorite animal. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll defend them if you like. Yeah, well, yeah Tara <laughs> can talk about them and defend them, but. Yeah, these these are very cool worms. Um, so they're, they're they're quite small, but they can grow to be quite big. I think. What did you say before? Uh, yeah. yeah, they can get up to nearly well ninety centimeters long. Wow. Apparently, so it's pretty big. That really terrifies me. <laughs> that, that, that that now terrifies me as well. But they have these really crazy teeth um, at the start. These big, powerful jaws that can come out and they eat all sorts of things. Now they're really not fussy eaters. They'll pretty much eat anything they. They come across, and it's really good for these environments because when things, um, you know, when things die or are decaying, they help to sort of rework um, this food and keep the, um, like the the ecosystem sort of moving, moving along. Um, yeah, so I don't know if anybody has been to the cinema lately, but you might have seen, <laughs> you might have seen some similar kind of uh, animals in June. So you can kind of compare these guys to the sandworms, though they definitely live more in mud, I reckon. Hopefully not that big. Hopefully not that big. Otherwise, Ben's well, that well, let's give them some ninety centimeters rather than than, than yeah. 90, <laughs> ninety meters. And um, but 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 let's let's sort of move on. So after that, we've got got these incredible looking creatures, sort of a, a flame shell and these like shells coming in. What what role do they play um, in in helping this the sort of seabed come back? Yeah, so these are these guys are a great example. So um, yeah, as you say, they're called flame shells, and they can form. Um, they can come come back in really great numbers, so really large numbers, and they can actually form almost like beds of of um, of shells. And this actually changes um, the way the seabed, what the seabed is made of in the first place. So you can go from quite a muddy seabed, very soft, then to this um, kind of this. Where as these shells break up, they actually yeah they change change what the bed's made of. And that can allow other organisms then to come in and settle on that slightly harder, tougher seabed that's made up of this shell rather than just very soft mud that things might sink into. Um, the flame shell is what we call a, a bivalve. So it's um, it has two, I think we've got a little thing here. So this is not a flame shell. This is a scallop, it's actually two different scallops. But essentially a bivalve means that it's um, two separate shells that come together like this and sort of opens up like that. So Amazing. That like that, yeah, that's that. That's that category of shell, and yeah, they're brilliant, and they're they're very um they were once very common in the Firth of Clyde up um in Arran. They form these large large beds over miles and miles and miles, and um really important organism. Yeah, fantastic. So almost as they're sort of like creating a sort of a hard a hard pack, and and it was just sort of turrets. Tur is it turret snail? I've seen lots of different names for 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 these spir amazing spirally looking looking 
and they're a snail. Is that right? Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just right. with each other. That's good. <laughs> yeah, so they're a snail or, or gastropod, which uh, how you know, depending on what you, what you want to call it. But um, yeah, so um, similar sort of thing. So they they can come back in very large numbers, and um, they build these shells, and when they die, those shells break up. And uh, they form that, again, that kind of hard pack, as you described, that other animals can then land on and, and grow out from. Yeah. But, and, and, and then so we've, so we've got um, worms coming and mixing everything up. We've got the hard pack shell. It's, it seems like sacrificing their skeletons for the, for the greater good. What, what kind of timescales are we um, sort of you know, talking about here? Yeah, so it, that's actually it's very difficult to say. Um, so it's kind of a more well-known process in on land because we can see that um, unfolding and we can just go out of our front doors and, and watch it happen. Whereas in the sea, it's very, very variable. It depends where you are. So if you're in the deep sort of cold depths where it's very dark, maybe there's less things happening, less, less going on. It will take more and more time. So, um, you know, maybe years, maybe decades it would take for these things to recover in shallower areas where there's more activity it might be, you know, a couple of years, things like that. But um, the, the other point about that is, which is really, really important for marine scientists, is that we don't really know because because this environment has been um, affected by human beings for so long. We don't really know what they could eventually look like, and um, we don't have a, an understanding of how good they could be, um, as it were. So it it's kind of remains it remains to be seen um, and that's part of what the, the, the convex seascape survey is aiming to do is, is to work out what these time scales might look like but and then we've got these 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 funny little creatures a sort of series of them we've got we've got a um i think uh, a sea pen I see, I, i've got never heard of a sea pen it looks like a sort of like almost like a sort of old fashioned quill type thing yeah. yeah definitely they're really really beautiful um so they look they are animals aren't they? they are. yeah so they look really like plants but again they are actually animals which is pretty cool um yeah they're um they're very fragile organisms so usually if you're seeing seeing these on the seabed it means well hopefully that hasn't been so disturbed in at least some amount of time and uh, yeah on this you can see these branches coming out either side and they're basically capturing food from the water so as the currents come through these little um spines will be capturing all little bits of food in the water column and they'll be eating those very cool animal it doesn't look like much but they're doing a lot brilliant and and then there's a sort of rather sort of odd translucent looking looking thing going on which is i'm not quite sure it says sea squirt for me i've got that that's just like a i think you've made this one up <laughs> yeah, yeah like well, alien sort of thing stuck to the bottom of the of the sea definitely very alien looking and they their name is really descriptive because they um can sort of squirt water in and out of their bodies um which yeah i guess is where that name comes from um yeah that's right they have they have what's called a siphon at the on, on the top there and yeah it's basically just their whole body acts like a pump and so they'll be pumping water through uh yeah, it really varies. So these guys are only small, but they can get, yeah, you know, sort of maybe m maybe half a metre high, um, depending on the species. Yeah, yeah. And 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 with this sort of sea pen is, and the sort of, um, and the sea squirt, is that sort of forming a sort of like mat of life on the, on the bottom of this? We've got, we've had the sort of worms doing their thing, and then we've got the hard, hardness of the shell, and then we've got this sort of mat of sort of like a big shaggy carpet of life yeah. that's, that's exactly right the, these these organisms can all pack in very tightly together so loads of different types can all live quite closely together um and the sea squirt um especially kind of needs that harder bottom to be able to settle on they need to be able to fix on something so they don't get washed away and so that kind of shell is really really important so they can establish themselves on the bottom there um yeah and so they'll be they'll be doing their thing they'll be essentially pumping water so they've got their own sort of um they've got their own what we'd call a function uh, their own activity that they contribute a role yeah that they contribute to the um to the wider community that lives there and that and their contribution is filtering water um sponges do a very similar thing they filter lots of water everyone has their has their role in this uh, in this community yeah and they can yeah we, if they're left alone form very very dense dense packs yeah so I'm seeing how we've gone from this barren, barren sort of like landscape, and we're sort of slowly building it up. 
And and the last ones we've got are the ones we saw in the video and the ones behind me, the 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 the, the brittle stars. How how what, what what how do they start to 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 bring life all, all back together again? Um. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I mean, brittle stars themselves can form what we call a, a, a brittle star bed. Um, so they will be sort of stacked on top of each other, hundred thousands and thousands of them can be spread over a really really quite large area. And um, again, they're sort of as they're feeding, they're they're taking little bits out of the water column, eating on eating those. They're then dying, and that then the, that sort of contributes to. Um, for, creates food for other organisms that are living inside the sea. So those worms and things like that, they're living underneath them. They will then get food from them. So it's all kind of everyone has this sort of their place in this system. And and um, brittle star beds are a, a really, really amazing example of, of how dense that life can get on the seabed. And I mean, it, I'm just it's amazing because because we've gone from something that looks like a ploughed field to something that's sort of heaving what was did you say thousands of brittle stars in this small amount just making almost a complete mat and providing food and, and the cycle of life going on a absolutely amazing so i think f how how i've mean, got a video and and for me it shows an amazing journey about from uh, remind me the, the this is just about 10 years i think of, right. of video and it shows a, a journey from 2014 to about 2022 or 2023 and and how how what what have we done or have we done anything to allow this process to happen yeah so so this video is sort of describing um again the sort of an area that's been trawled so all of these things all these animals have kind of been removed by these large nets but then all we've really had to do is just leave it alone. So it doesn't really take much. We just have to create an area that we don't trawl in for a certain amount of time. This this particular habitat is quite shallow. It's about 20 meters deep, um, which is it feels, it seems deep, but it's relatively shallow compared to the rest of the ocean. And, um, and so it's actually, it's recovered really quite quickly. And I, as I said before, you know, a lot of these organisms are very resilient they're very good at bouncing back. So although they might get swept away in very quickly, um, they they can recover if we give them a chance to do so. And it doesn't, yeah, it's, it doesn't really take that much effort. We just have to let them do their thing and, and give them a, breath, a bit of breathing space. Um, amazing. And and that just, just fills me with, with wonderful hope that, that by, by stopping what we're doing, there are these superhero animals, these hero animals who, who can just, rebuild habitats um just i know we've got lots of questions but just before we get onto that what would be amazing um would be to to look at i know that leaving them alone is one thing but there are some other issues that are are happening uh, and we've got some notes i think on, on three big issues that maybe classes at school um, or wherever you are c can think about in terms of help helping our heroes um, because if, if we keep on doing sort of other things to the ocean then they're probably going to be a bit stressed as well and i think the sort of first one um is 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 climate change and and what you know our worms our sea squirts our new friends um does, does things do things like climate change sort of stress them or or, or harm them yeah, I think climate change is a really big, scary sounding problem at the minute. And um, yeah, it, it definitely can affect life everywhere. Because um, with climate change, we're worried about seas getting warmer um, and also like acidifying. So that's a big concern at the minute. Um, I think this is like what Ben was saying before, that we don't we don't really see a lot of these um, communities of animals and plants like they're very out of, out of the way and very hidden but um it is really important to remember that they are still affected like like we are on land by um these changes um yeah yeah that's, that's absolutely right they, they are facing a, a number of different threats from different angles um and while they are resilient there are uh, yeah other other issues that they will face in the future um and you know as, as tara says you know climate change is a kind of a big scary scary idea but um it's amazing, you know, what, what, what communities can do. I'm talking about human communities now, yeah. us up on land. 
um, you know, to to sort of tackle these problems. And um, you know, you can you can do loads to you know put uh, make people aware of the issue. Um, talk to your you talk to you know people in your schools, maybe a headmaster, local councils, things like that. And you know, we we have examples of, of young people in the world today who have done amazing things, putting loads and loads of pressure on the people that matter to um to make the changes that we, that we need to see to to um protect these communities in the sea amazing and thank you um ben but the, the, the second one we we have is, is sort of we've got a picture of food and i know that food is probably one of the sort of biggest areas that you can sort of make it make a difference with um but it also really relates to sort of eating you know seafood or eating meat or eating vegetables how how, how does what we eat affect um a sea pen for instance <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's right. It's 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 a funny it's a funny sort of connection, isn't it? When you go to the supermarket, you're affecting a sea pen in Scotland at 100 meters <laughs> from the dark. But um, that is actually unfortunately absolutely the case. Um, as we mentioned before, that fishing fishing practice of, of trawling is one of the main ways in which we we collect our seafood, collect our fish. And so, you know, one thing you can do on on a on a personal level is I think it's just make that connection. On the one hand, that's I think that's really really important. It's just when you're making these decisions from from day to day. Uh, it, you can just think about, you know, where this came from in the process, but not just about yourself, but talk to other people as well and 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 communicate with people that can make maybe bigger changes. So whether well, that might be your parents or or again, you know, people in your other people in your school, your headmaster and things like that. So I think the more young people are just consciously thinking about where their food is coming from, um, that's going to have a huge impact in the future as this generation grows up, and it's it's going to it's going to change everything. I think. Yeah. I think as well, like you don't have to you don't have to give up all of these things, and especially not all at once. You know, you can make really small changes, just you know, one day a week or just one item of food. You know, you can just make little changes, and that'll that's that's better than doing nothing. Absolutely. Perfect. And then the last one is, is one that I know that a lot of school our schools are sort of concerned about, and that's. Um, looking at um plastic pollution um and it's obviously been in 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 the media and the news a lot um when you're out in, in these type of areas do you do you see evidence of plastic pollution in, in these types of areas absolutely yeah we, we we see we see plastic all the time when we're out on the boat um we, we've worked both worked in very remote areas around the world you know as, as we've been marine scientists we've worked in tiny islands off in the middle of the ocean you know not a human being for a thousand miles kind of thing and, and we still see see plastic washing up on the shore um so it's a, it, it's a it's a really extensive problem the plastic pollution issue but it's also one of the most easily solved um and you know just through small kind of uh, community changes we or in this country i can't remember what, when it when it happened now we we managed to ban um disposable plastic bags or at least put a charge on those and and straws, yeah, plastic straws. That was a really, really big one. So it really didn't take much, and everybody sort of was quite upset for about it, about it for about a week, and then everyone forgot. And it's made a massive difference to the input of disposable plastic, at least from the UK into the ocean. So it seems like this really, really big problem, and it and it is, and it can be. But we can also solve it quite easily if we if we're willing to do so, which is very hopeful. So some amazing input. Thank you both very, very much. You've got a sheet. We're just going to um, take a pause for a little bit. Do put in, um, as a class, think about who you might ask to make changes, whether you're going to make changes as a class, whether you're going to get your head teacher to do it, your family to do it, and just post a few of those um, ideas into um, the live chat, and then we'll come in a minute or so, we'll come to your questions. But thank you very much both. We'll come to questions um, in just a tick.
um, for putting those in. Um, that that's been amazing. Um, and we've got some great things sort of like um, getting on the sort of vegan vegetarian side. This is the, the diet side. One or two days a week seems to be a big one. So thank you very much, Tara, for for for, for, for suggesting that. And I'm sure you've got some other great um, ideas too. Um, just to come to the questions, we'll, we'll we'll get through as many as possible. We haven't got huge amounts of time left, um, but let's go for um, in terms of um, with plastic pollution. Uh, apart from sort of, are, are there any good fixes for stopping getting from stopping plastic from getting into the sea, other than just reducing our use of it? Are there sort of like sieves that you could put on rivers, and that's from St John's Ripley. Yeah, absolutely. That's, I mean, that's, you know, if you can stop the problem in its source, that's, that's, that's brilliant. And, um, you know, you, you remove the issue before it even gets there. And that, that absolutely is the case. There's lots of projects around the world that um, have different technologies that you use to capture plastic as it, as it ends after, after it's entered the river and before it enters the sea. Um, very efficient way of, of removing plastic for sure. Yeah, that's, that's a great, a great um, positive move forward there. Brilliant. Um, and this question from St. Teresa's class at St. Ursula's Catholic Primary. Um, we've talked a lot about the effect of water pollution on um, nature. What about for humans? Does, does water pollution harm humans as well, they would like to know? Yeah, it, it definitely can do. Um, I think in one way that's really important for us in... Yeah, and by the coast surfers and, mm. and divers, and it, it is a constant um, kind of thing that's talked about especially in the winter when it's raining a lot so yeah big issue yeah but, um uh thank you um this is from st christopher's um uh, how many different types of fish are there around the uk um oh. and i know that it's a really horrible thing to ask because marine scientists you know you could probably tell me all about brazones or sea squirts and a fish expert wouldn't 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 know about fish i can um, but are, are, are we losing the number of different fish? I mean, we've talked about issues of, of the sea, tiny animals in the seabed. Is that affecting fish as well? Yeah, definitely. Well, these are amazing questions. And I think it's always really good for us as well to be given tough questions. They make us think. Um, yeah, Ben, have you got any idea how many how many fish there are? I'm not sure exactly. I, it's probably around, probably a little under 200 fish species in the UK. I imagine somewhere around that. Um, uh, and it really depends as well because you can have some fish that come from elsewhere that are called invasive species, um, so they don't necessarily belong here. Um, so you have, it kind of varies quite a bit. So, oh yeah, I mean may, may, maybe there's more than two hundred. So uh, definitely, definitely a fair few. But yes, this, these fishing practices um, that we're talking about, this this um, trawling and things like that, do remove large amounts of fish. I mean that's the thing that's really aiming for is is, is the fish that we that we're sort of aiming for for our food. So um, where we were in, again in Aran is a really, really great example of how fishing can massively um, what we call deplete the fish populations there. So at one time, um, there were loads and loads of different species around Aran and thousands and thousands of individuals. And now they, those those fish just aren't there anymore. They don't exist there anymore. Um, yeah, it sort of changes where they live. So if, you know, if you're really disturbing their homes, then you might see, yeah. Um, well, you'll lose some of those fish, then they'll also move to other places where they can where they can live. So, and by bringing back the seabed and by stopping f fishing practices, we also help the fish come back. Yeah, definitely. Great, good, good news all round. Good. Um, have we recently made any proper improvements about looking after the sea, or are we actually starting to change? Um, and that's from Four NH. Um, yeah, I mean, so around the UK, we've got a lot of areas that are protected. Um, so we say protected because you can't do these these types of fishing there that, that we've talked about today. So the dredging. Um, I think over time, we're protecting these places more. So like really making sure that you, you can't fish there because sometimes we say that they're protected and people can still sneak in and, and stuff like that. So I think that's something that is changing and will change more into the future. Um, I think Ben mentioned as well earlier that it is a little bit of a balance, you know, because for people fishing, it's their jobs, it's their livelihoods. And we do eat fish. That's really it's a really important food source to a lot of people around the world. Um, so it's just all about finding this balance um, between the two activities. 
um yeah which i think we are doing more and more and we ha we have some great success stories as well from more specific um conservation attempts so uh, when we think about whales for example it's it's one of the, one of the example of a really really amazing success story whales were um unfortunately hunted for a long time um up until sort of quite recently um and since we've stopped hunting whales certain species like the humpback whale which is that amazing um that amazing kind of whale that jumps out of the water and makes these amazing shows they they've come back in in really really well so we've stopped hunting them and loads of them have returned so we know that that this kind of um concept of leaving these animals alone letting them recover by themselves does work um with these uh, examples of successes so um there's it's fantastic to hear that. There's two questions I think we've just got time for. One mini question and one big question. The mini question is um, about eating fish. So it's really confusing that when, when we hear about destructive fishing practices, where we hear about you know what's happening to the seabed, and yet we've got also some people calling um, some fish sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very mixed message for, for young people. Is there anything that you you could you could say that would would make that simpler <laughs> is that your big question or <laughs> <laughs> um i yeah. think the safest <laughs> is really difficult the safest thing to do would maybe be not eat fish but that's like a really big change to make and it, it's not necessarily the the only solution for making making things better for the life out there um yeah i think I think you can make more sustainable choices. So definitely like buying more locally. Um, if you live somewhere close to the sea, you probably have like shops, you know, with actual like, that fishmongers, you know, will go out, fishermen will go out and then come back, back in and sell their fish that day. So choices like that might be a slightly better option. Um, it is a really complicated issue. W would it be safe to say if you've got a smaller boat and you've got, gear that's not sort of big and chunky and destructive and you're you're sort of only taking little bits from the whole from the whole places it's really looking at how people are fishing rather than the type of fish would that be yeah right? yeah yeah definitely so like like you say jamie those kind of methods have a, a lot less impact than these massive nets that you know trawl the the oceans you you can definitely yeah have less of an impact that way um yeah and here, so that was a big question. Here's a small question. Um, very sadly, we've come to the end of the lesson. Um, what would you say to our young people in terms of of um, what they can do to, to to help the ocean into the future? Become marine scientists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's um, like something that really helps me is it feels like there's so many problems, and especially with the sea, it feels sometimes so far away and like you can't really make a difference, but. There are so many small things that you can do and just staying positive and like talking to people and, you know, trying to just, yeah, remain, remain hopeful about things is probably the most powerful thing that you can do. Yeah. Well, thank you both so, so much. Um, and thank you to all the classes who've been watching. It's been fantastic to have you um, and have a wonderful rest of British Science Week. Until the next time, it's bye bye from us. Bye bye. 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 bye.